Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Thanks a lot for stopping by on this video on Cisco's campus networking solution, which is called as SC Access. I know that there are already a lot of videos that exist on SD Access. Even there is a very good documentation, design guides, validated designs available from Cisco side on their website. But in this video, what I will be covering some thoughts, process that went into this solution. What was that big why? behind SD access and what are those key reasons that were there in the mind of these engineers who were like designing this as the access as a solution even before this solution went public so my journey with SD access goes back somewhere around 2020 and where I got my first project and when I look at this solution, I had gone through some trainings, but during this first project, there were many queries that I was having and being a technologist, I wanted to know like, what was that big reason behind this SD access? Because so, if you ask me at that time, this solution when I was just going through a few training was sounded very similar to ACI, which is a Cisco data center networking solution, very successful by the way. And it has uh, its APIC. Then there are some uh, switches which are called spine and leaf. And uh, you just connect them uh, right same way in here you have dna and then your switches which are like core and then maybe access switches and you connect it in a spine leaf architecture you can have distribution layer as well so i was thinking like why can't just aci be molded into this and why there was a need for this new solution in the first place. So with all these queries, I started reaching out to few folks. But before we jump into this video where I will be covering all these thoughts for you, what the responses I got and uh, hopefully by the end of this video, you will be clear about this big why. So this video, even if you have worked on SD access, this should give you a new perspective about why the SD access, or if you are somebody who is completely new to SD access, this should give you a new perspective around SD access, and this doesn't require any prior knowledge of SD access. So with that, uh, what we will be covering in this uh, video is only two points, very simple agenda. We will be spending majority of our time on key thought process. And then towards the end of the video, we will be talking about SD access terminology, where I will be talking, of course, at a very high level, what are the different components that are there in SD access. So when I got this uh, first project, I looked at uh, the content that was available and I started reaching out to the people. So what I got is this. And I challenge you not to hear the word intent-based networking when you watch any enterprise uh, SD access solution from the marketing side of it. But I was not able to understand what this intent is. 
so i reached out to few of the folks who were doing uh, such videos they were talking about it in the cisco live as well and then i came to know that uh, your it uh, dns center help you to program your intent so when that person was talking about this i asked him like okay give me an example so he said sunil at a very high level let's say you want to provision a vn which is nothing but a vrf if you want to provision in dns center you just come on the gui do some click 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 and then that vn will be provisioned on all these underlying switches with some simple set of clicks you don't need to worry about any of the complexities by the way who had uh, like those of you who have worked on uh, this when you configure a vrf you know we configure rd we configure rt we configure uh, some routing protocols around it to make it fully work or maybe static routing you know it, it's a subtle line of configuration uh, that gone into vrf but dns center you just do with some clicks and that piece uh, so this person was telling me that sonil is called the automation side of it i was like okay automation i was thinking in my mind that i can do with some scripting also right or i can have some ansible playbooks and i can do some scripting i was somewhere not convinced that is this the reason for this so i continued uh, my journey and uh, i interacted with more folks then one of them told me that with dns center what we are planning for campus networking is to take out some more values from the packet that are traversing the network i was uh, like a hard to digest this for me so i asked for an example and uh, he he said that we will get to an example but this piece we call it as assurance and i said yes i hear assurance in uh, the context of sdxs solution so tell me something more about it so he said when there is a host who onboard onto the network what he does he first authenticate itself i said yes then it uh, get the ip address maybe from the dhcp server and then it uh, let's say uh, access the application uh, which is maybe hosted on the cloud or locally i said yes but then this person told that in case of any problem this host will tell you that my network is not working or my pc is not working now there are these individual pcs problem can be anywhere but being a network admin you need to look for all these pcs uh being coming from a troubleshooting background i was completely relating myself to this and i said yes this is one of the big pain in the butt uh, but how is the access is solving it so he said no let, let's come back to assurance we are not talking about as the access this assurance what i will tell you uh, is that if there is a insight available that tells you that how much time it took to authenticate how much time it took to take the ip address for that and host and then some more real time analytics from the network which shows you the health of the network 
will it be easy for you to look on that dashboard and figure out where is the problem i was uh, like yes and then he was uh, having access to a dnac uh, demo setup and he showed me that on the client assurance dashboard see uh, it's showing the time it's taking for authentication ip address and you see that uh, the ip address that is getting from dhcp that process is taking some time that gives me this information on this dashboard that there can be some problem on the DHCP side that we need to look. I was like, yes, this is great. It can make uh, the life of uh, the network operator easy. And uh, he, he said that this is a journey. And then we are also working on some steps which can remediate this problem by itself without even operator intervening. So this, this conversation was moving towards uh, more of marketing. So I said, yes, I understood it. Uh, thanks a lot for giving me this perspective. Uh, and we, I moved on. Uh, so by the way, uh, for those of you who have worked, uh, what we were discussing here is this client 360 view. And those of you who have not worked on SD access, Think of it like this assurance dashboard, which it shows you the health inside of the network. Switches health, router health, endpoint health, all that. So this, I was thinking that can assurance be that reason to come out with a new product? Uh, this can be uh, done in some existing monitoring network portfolio as well. So this made sense to me at that time, but I was like still continuing with my journey because I was not still satisfied. So then I interacted with uh, one more person. He was uh, talking about SD access and he told that SD access is a solution and DNAC can completely automate that flow for you, then your fabric, which will have macro segmentation, micro segmentation, and all it is provisioned by the DNA center. It was uh, year 2020, as I was saying initially, I was still learning as the access, so this went way above my head. Uh, I, I didn't ask any question. I was like, okay, sir, makes sense. Thank you very much. But then uh, with this, I was still continuing with my journey uh, on why, why, why is the access? So then it happened that I was uh, able to connect with one of the senior person who was there in designing this solution when even when it was not public and uh, then what i came to know uh, that uh, he is there to talk about it so i took that opportunity and we interacted and i told him uh, at the start itself that i know dna can do automation i know dna can do assurance i know dna can do sd access also but I still want to know why in the first place uh, this we came up with this solution. So he said, uh, okay, let me ask you a few questions, Sonil. I was like, okay, uh, go ahead. So those questions I still remember and I will put it in front of you as well. Since this is a recorded video, I will be answering those, but you can take a pause and uh, then answer it. And then maybe you can match. But these are very simple questions, by the way. So let's start with our first question. At what layer do you implement access list to block IP traffic? We'll take a pause here in case you want to answer. 
I hope you did. Um, so the answer to this is the layer three IP layer. Uh, I went one step ahead, uh, couldn't control my excitement at that time, that you configure an access list, you define your source address, you define your destination address, and you say permit or deny. He was like, okay, yes, uh, you are right. Now move on. So we came to our second question, which was at what layer do you implement quality of service to prioritize traffic based on DHCP values? So we'll take a pause here in case you guys want to answer this. I hope you did. So the answer is layer three IP layer. And having worked on QoS, uh, I was quick enough to say that you implement your QoS policy based on uh, IP address. So he, he was like, yes, that's what uh, we do. And then he asked me the third question, which was, by the way, the last question. At what layer do you implement policy-based routing to redirect traffic based on source IP address? In case you guys want to answer. OK, so the answer to this is also layer 3. And I told like PBR, you always do on source IP address. And answer is layer three, IP addressing. So he said, uh, this is good, uh, Sunil. And then he took a, another uh, piece of paper and brought this in front of me that this is how a enterprise network look like. This is your core switches, let's say. You have your distribution somewhere here, and then this is your access uh, layer switches, which you call edge. And then if we look at these enterprise campus network, they had evolved over a period of time. Now, what we talk, uh, when we talk about enterprises, customer always talk about smart buildings they always talk about their digitization journey and what that had resulted into this sunil uh, if i look at uh, the endpoints it is not only the number of endpoints that had increased it is also the type of endpoint that had increased and he also given me the examples that initially, like if you look at uh, the traditional networking, it was laptops or PCs. Then we started connecting phones. Then this industry 4.0 came in and we connected some sensors. We connected video endpoints. And then the list goes on. And today, even your building management system, BMS, is also connected to the network. I was like, yes, this is true. Uh, so then he said that all of these endpoints, which are connected to the network, they need some sort of network policy. And this policy can be anything. For example, if you deploy uh, QoS, because you have IP phones in your network, you design a QoS policy for that. If since you have these many type of endpoints, you want to have some sort of security policy, then you design an access list to block or permit some sort of traffic. So, I was like, yes, this is true. And 
then he said that all of this that you do these policies irrespective of type of it qos security policy based routing segmentation any of that you implement based on these five tuples ip source address destination address protocol the port numbers or you use this dhcp also in case you want to implement qos policy so you implement all these even the traffic engineering that you do today is based on ip addressing so he given one more example that this is endpoint one and this is your default path to exit from the network but i have some organization's requirement business requirement that endpoint two the default path is this this is default path but endpoint two when it come it should go via this path so what you will do is you will implement some sort of pbr here which is here again based on ip addresses why so let me clear the ink so any policy you design based on these ip addresses because it is the only information that survive end to end and that's the reason uh, in our previous questions as well that you had seen or in these policies also which i took example of few of them we implement based on ip addresses so currently if you look at ip address today in the network it is a locator for you identifier it also drives the treatment that you should get in the network are you allowed to talk to this endpoint or you are not allowed to talk to this endpoints all this is based on ip addresses what is the problem with this like we are overloading that ip address currently with so many uh, of these things so the first problem is let's say you want to implement a segmentation policy okay you define your access list permit okay then you say x dot x to z dot z is deny then a b can talk to a c is permit i'm just taking some random examples and then this access list goes on and as i was saying initially like now not only the number of endpoint the type of endpoints had also increased and then what the network operators normally do they keep on expanding this access list even though some of these endpoints doesn't exist in the network the people who had configured these acls have left the organization but the current network operator is afraid to remove any of these entries and it just piled up and uh, it goes like somewhere around thousands of entries in an access list while some of them doesn't even make sense and this is a big operational overhead because of our dependencies on the ip addresses then he said that uh, let's say you want to onboard a new system in the bms what you will do sunil you will provision a new vlan you configure it with the new ip subnet and then you start uh, onboarding your end host in this uh, new subnet i was like yes this is what we do so then he was saying that now let me tell you a fundamental problem here and listen to me very carefully guys currently in the network 
there is no way exists which can tell that this packet belong to Sunil and this packet belong to John. What we do or what the network understand is only the IP addressing. It cannot identify you whether you are Sunil or a person X, Mohan or whatever. Right? This is the problem. Now, I was like completely into this listening mode because this started making sense to me. So he said that Sunil, you wear your thinking hat and see what if we could make the IP address just a locator for you. And then we give you some other ways to apply the policy. I will let that sink in uh, for a moment. What if the IP address can just be the locator for you and there are some other ways to apply the policy. So if we break this dependencies between IP address and network policy, this can result into much simpler network. I was uh, now like completely in the receiving mode, as I said, and this started making sense to me that yes, because currently the IP address is overloaded, it is resulting into some complex network, but I was still not sure, is this something that they are breaking with SDXS? So I just listened and he said that, let me, tell you that with this, you can run your network in a much simpler way. You apply the policy irrespective of your IP address, VLAN, subnets, whatever. So then since I worked on MPLS in the past, I worked on VRF and all I asked, are you saying that uh, we are doing it with some MPLS or something? He said, no, we are not implementing any MPLS, any complexity of that sort. And let me tell you like how we are doing it, we will tell you. But before that, if I provide you up on top of this, this layer two and layer three function flexibility also without stretching the VLAN, will that make the campus operator's life easy? This also I was able to relate because working on an campus uh, network, we always face these issues that, okay, VLAN, let's say 10, exist on these two switches. So we try to connect our endpoints here. If there is a other part of the network and there is a requirement for VLAN 10 there, we always try to extend it and then we just uh, configure it, take this VLAN all the way to this and then we provision. Application guys never understood this pain, but being a network operator, I had seen like how much we had struggled when we extend these VLANs. Again, I'm talking about the traditional networking. So I confirmed again that are you saying that you are not stretching any of these VLANs, but still you are providing me this flexibility that I can connect the endpoint anywhere. He was like, yes. Then the stage is set for me and I said, okay, now tell me well, hi, well, how SDXS is doing it because I understood the key thought process and I hope by now you are also with me till this point. Then he said that, okay, let me tell you how we are solving it with SDXS. So he drawed this in front of me that, okay, you draw a very simple campus network with some uh, core access switches. We connected, there are some uh, routers also, WLCs, wireless controllers and all that exist in a campus network. 
you configure it with the like simple plain IP addressing and this is called as your underlay. So you build this network once and then you implement all of your segmentation, all of your policies, everything in the overlay. And in this overlay, as a part of SP access solution, we are doing two things. One of them is for control plane. Another one is data plane. So in the control plane, what we are doing is Lisp. And uh, I'm not going any of the details of the Lisp, but think of it as a mapping server or a database. Where what it do is that endpoint one, it have this information like endpoint one is connected to switch one, endpoint two is connected to switch two. So when there is a end host which comes and inquire that okay, I need to reach out to endpoint two, it will reach to that mapping server, ask where endpoint two is connected, and that mapping server will tell it is on switch two, so the traffic will send to switch two. So that is at a very, very high level it do. And then uh, we jumped in the data plane discussion and uh, I couldn't control my excitement. And I said, how uh, you are breaking that dependency between IP address and policy? He said, wait, this is where we do that. So in the data plane, we do VXLAN. And without going any of the complexity or any of the working of VXLAN, what he told is that in the VXLAN, there is a field called tag. So what we do here is, let's say if Sunil is authenticating to the network, he will get a tag of 10. If John is authenticating, he will get a tag of 11. If Mohan is coming, he will get a tag of 12. Irrespective of where Sunil is connected in the network, he will always get the tag of 10. And if the policy says that Sunil should not talk to John, what I will do is I will simply put a policy that 10 should not be talking to 11. It's a deny. This is how we are breaking the uh, dependency between IP addressing and the policy. So segmentation you can achieve based on these tags. And by the way, these tags are called as SGTs security group tags or scalable group tag, whatever you call it. And this is how SD access was able to break that dependency. And this is how you define segmentation in your network. So I hope this is clear. And by this time, I was also clear that, okay, these were some of the key thoughts when they were designing this solution that they wanted to break these dependencies and this is how they are doing it. So next time when you see SDXS support micro segmentation, macro segmentation, you know, think about this. Macro is still at a VRF level that we saw earlier, VN, but micro is this. I hope this is clear. Uh, but by this time, uh, I was satisfied and uh, we started deploying the SDXS uh, for the customer. I conveyed this thought also uh, to some of the engineers who were working along with me and 
they received it well but then there was another discussion that had brought up uh, before that just clear the sink so you see how the fabric break the dependencies and in the policies are actually tied up with the user or identity so now let's move on to our next discussion which is uh, like what is uh, the real power of the fabric so it happened that during the discussions we were talking to a few of uh, the network operators uh, before designing the sdxs fabric for them and they said that what they need is a uptime of five nines and what uh, and if, if you are from the it department you will be able to relate to this that the it heads what they are worried about is the uptime of the network so then uh, we said that you can have this level of uptime if you do three things in your network you design your network with best practices you implement your network with best practices and then you don't touch it but then there was this another gentleman sitting in this uh, room he was saying if we don't touch our network how we will be able to introduce new services how we will be able to move ahead with our digitization journey so that also we answered in the form of stxs that you have your underlay network connect it configure it once and then you don't touch it so your it team is happy and you put all your services on the overlay so this is your underlay and this is the overlay so that way you can have that segregation in underlay and overlay and both the teams can achieve their goals so this is uh, by the way another perspective that as the access provides uh, when you look at the fabric so now we are coming towards the end of this video so let me tell you what all components actually goes in SDXS. For those of you who have worked, will know this already, but if some of you who haven't worked, so what you have is a underlying uh, switching infrastructure that you see here. Uh, these are your edge switches where your endpoints connect. And then you have your some intermediate nodes and you have some nodes uh, which are called as fabric border node and control plane node remember we talk about one protocol called lisp so these are your lisp control plane node which actually manage that mapping database mapping uh, these are as mapping servers which have that database about where the endpoints are actually connected so if you look at the traditional networking where arc was used so let's say if i am entering into a class which is full of students and i just want to know who is mr x i will simply shout out his name like x and then if that class can hear me till the end Mr. X will raise its hand and then that's how I come to know that, okay, he's X. I can call him and we can have that conversation. That's how in networking also, when the endpoint one doesn't know endpoint two, it will simply broadcast that. And then the endpoint two respond that, okay, I'm here. You can talk to me directly. What with the help of Lisp, what we are doing is instead of all these broadcasting, 
I am asking simply there is a attendant, let's say, who is sitting in the class. I am asking, is Mr. X is there in the class? He will say, yes, X is there. Let me call him for you. So instead of like, I am going into the class shouting, uh, who is Mr. X, this attendant can help me with that. Same way you look at here that this mapping server will have all this information where exactly the endpoints are connected. So that information is there and this is there on this control plane node. We have these border nodes which are like acting as a border for the fabric. And then you have this Cisco DNS center somewhere like commonly it's deployed in customer data center and you should have reachability from this fabric infrastructure till here and this is responsible for configuring this you integrate your ice identity service engine as a part of stxs solution so ice is responsible for the endpoint authentication and getting them the tag then you also implement the fabric wireless LAN controller with it from those of you who are from the wireless side they will see the benefit that now for wired and wireless there can be a single fabric and you can have your centralized policy plane and we have talked about policy how fabric is implementing policy already in this video so this is at a very very high level what software defined access network looks like so with that we have come to an end of this video i hope this was informative for you i was able to make you understand the key thought process behind sd access and uh, i would like to say thanks uh, for spending your time on this thank you